Hello there, friends. Andrea with the Banks here. I've been listening to the Lord of Spirits podcast and the Amon Sul podcast for a while now. Longtime listener, first time doing a podcast with the host. So I heard Father Andrew Stephen Damick quote G.K. Chesterton saying, it's only Christian men who protect even pagan things. And that's something that just captured my curiosity. And I wanted to speak with him further about what exactly that means, because it's something that I've been wrestling with and trying to understand about all these things that seem rather pagan that have been, I guess you would say, incorporated into Christianity. And so he was kind enough to say yes and to come on my podcast and wait for me to take forever to edit said podcast before I get it out. So thank you, Father Andrew, for coming on to my show. And thank you, all of those who are watching. Please leave me a comment or a question for Father Andrew. So it's a bit of a longer one, but that's because we had to cover a lot of ground. So I think that's it, and I will get on with the show. Hello, Father Andrew Stephen Damick. I said the whole name, so it's proper. But anyway, Hello, it's... Andrea with the bangs. Yes. Oh, right. That is my full proper internet name. So, yay. All right. So, but, but Father Andrew, um, I know you from Lord of Spirits, the Lord of Spirits podcast. Sure. That? Yes. And from Amon Sul, and I know you have multiple other podcasts. So could you, did I miss any? I missed a few. Do you want to fill in the gaps of the other podcasts? Sure. The, the ones that are um, ongoing, besides the ones you just mentioned, there's also the Areopagus, uh, which is a podcast that I do with a local Protestant pastor who's a, a good friend of mine. And then there's another one called Orthodox Engagement, which is a little bit more occasional, and that's an interview podcast where I, I do long-form interviews with people. And then the two podcasts that I have that are archived now, um, Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy is the best known and then I also have one called Roads from Emmaus, which was kind of a grab bag of mostly sermons, but occasionally talks about other things. Um, so so I've been involved with, with producing six podcasts and four are current. I also have four books, uh, you know, obligatory plug for my brand new book, Arise, O God, mm -hmm, The Gospel mm -hmm. of Christ's Defeat of Demon, Sin and Death. Uh, oh, that's a great subtitle. Thank you very much. Uh, but then a few other books as well. Um, well, actually, I have. Uh, that's one know. of my books. Yes, that's yes. book number three. I'm not three. current. I'm not current. I'm so. Okay. Well, you, we'll you, work do, on you, it. you do live way up in the frozen places. I, it takes so long to, you know, go from regular vehicle to to dog sled to, you know. Right. To deliver. So. Right. I have I, an excuse. I, I, I get it. You have a yeah. very good excuse. <laughs> yes. Okay, so could we do a quick sort of background, um, and it doesn't have to be quick, but I'm trying to be uh, uh, conservative with, with the times, but, so, and, and I know we have a lot to get to, but um, yeah, just an a intro to how you became Orthodox, or, or uh, that's kind of far back, so you, or how you became an Orthodox priest, uh, wherever you'd like to start from for your background. Sure. Yeah, so I was raised as the son of evangelical Protestant missionaries. Um, when I was when I was born, my dad was in the United States Navy, and then my parents became missionaries when I was seven years old. And uh, when I was ten, we moved to the Pacific island of Guam, which belongs to the United States but has a very different culture from the United States in in a lot of ways. Um, and we lived there for five years, and then moved back to the U.S. And when I was in college, at about the age of twenty two or so, um, I started having a lot of big questions about, especially what is the relationship between truth and beauty and worship? Um, that's really kind of where it came down for me. And uh, at the time I was going to the beginnings of an evangelical mega church. I say the beginnings because, you know, there were only a couple thousand people in church on Sunday. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah just a couple thousand. Um, although I mean, I had not grown up in that context because, I mean, that didn't 
really exist on a broad scale when I was really young. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I, um, it's it's kind of a long story, but I, I discovered the Orthodox Church existed and uh, through a lot of reading primarily. And then I visited an Orthodox Church and was just utterly taken by the worship. And um, from there, you know, then I, I started seeing the the historical reality of Orthodox Christianity as as the historic church. Um, and then in the um, spring of 1998, at the Feast of Great and Holy Pascha, I was received as an Orthodox Christian in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was 22 at the time. And, um, and then a, f- a few years after that, I met um, my wife, we got married. And then uh, just a year after that, although sometimes I wish maybe we'd waited a little bit longer, a year after that, I went to seminary in 2004 at St. Tikhon Seminary here in Pennsylvania and graduated in 2007. I was ordained to the priesthood in 2006, so while I was in seminary, okay. and then spent um, spent a couple of years after graduation as the assistant pastor at the Cathedral of St. George in Charleston, West Virginia, or as they pronounce it locally, West by God, Virginia. Um, and then, and then was assigned in 2009. If you ever go to West Virginia, you will immediately understand. Oh, oh uh, I, I, that'll be on the bucket list. There you go. Yes, <laughs> it is a beautiful, beautiful state, actually. Um, but, but most of the people there do believe that they live in the center of the universe. So it's, mm. it, but that's okay. You know, okay. that's okay. Uh, and then in 2009, <laughs> I was assigned as the pastor of, of St. Paul Orthodox Church in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, which is where I live now. Mm-hmm. And I served for the, the, as the pastor of St. Paul's for 11 years. Mm-hmm. And then a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago now, I was um, hired full-time as the chief content officer for Ancient Faith Ministries. Uh, we had been working, collaborating together for years before that, you know, podcasts, books, blogs. So it just kind of made sense for me to come on staff mm-hmm. and continue to be a, a content creator for them. But also I'm involved in, in helping to mentor other content creators and and uh, recruiting new ones and, and that sort of thing as well. So mm-hmm. um, it, it, it is accurate to say in a lot of ways I kind of live on the Internet. Um, but but really, I live in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, which is a great place to live. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I this is. I, I kind of almost pinch myself every day, like how it is it that I got to have this as my my profession? The, the, you know? best, the it, best is that so many people are after what you, like I want to get to be on the internet and be paid for a living. <laughs> and and you're like, hey, hey, Orthodox church that I am a priest for, ancient space. But I'm going to also occupy like one of the newest spaces in the world, the Internet. You, you, you get it. Yeah. You get the best of both worlds, kind of literally. Yeah. And, and I mean, and I also have the advantage slash blessing of what I'm doing, kind of not depending on selling advertising or clicks or whatever. Right. So right. I, I How don't is, need, is it ancient I don't faith need to... radio is is the like. How does that go? Like, is it just donations? Where does the money come from? Where, where does the money come from? I'm Who so sorry. I'm not sure okay. if I'm supposed to ask that. So Ancient Faith has two kind of major divisions. So there's Ancient Faith Radio and there's Ancient Faith Publishing. Okay. But then we also have some other ones, you know, Ancient Faith Blogs and uh, Ancient Faith Film, you know, some videos. Um and we're starting some foreign we, we've started some foreign language divisions. So we have a Spanish division, Spanish language division, which is kind of plugging into all the other parts. And we also, uh, it, although we haven't really announced it widely yet, we actually have a, a Chinese language division now as well. Um, again, plugging into these various these various other media that we're in. So where does the money come from? Um, well, we we are a department of the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America, but we do not take any money from the Archdiocese. So it's we're not funded by the Archdiocese, okay. unlike other departments. Okay. Um, we have funding from from two sources, really. So, um, and there's lots and lots of small donations that we get on a regular basis, and that's so great. You know, it's listeners who and readers who want to support what we're doing. Um, we also have some some big donors, you know, people mm. that God has blessed a lot. And so they they make donations to make 
often to make particular projects happen. Mm. But then there are also those that, that support us on a regular basis as well. But then also um, selling books and, and other items uh, is a, also a big piece of our, our funding. Um, mm. I'm not sure if it's the biggest piece. I'm, I'm not the money guy. Uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, that's, that's a, a big piece of it as well. So sales, you know, so we're, we're out there directly selling books to people and, and some other stuff too. But it's mostly books. I mean, that's, that's our biggest thing as a publisher. Um, and, and, you know, mostly our own books. But we do third party sell some other books and some and icons and stuff like that. You know, the kind of things you'd find in an orthodox bookstore mm -hmm. so that's that's where the money comes from um we're, we're not taking it from any <laughs> any nefarious sources it, it's uh well you know, it's the, just yeah. yeah yeah i don't it i i yeah it, it's sort of one of those things where you're just like oh you get to do this for a living how do you get to do this for a living yeah so that's Through really a combination amazing. of people's generosity and also, you know, that we're we have products to sell. Well, and books like real books with real pages. Like there's something really yeah. wonderful about that yeah. too. So we, we we sell the fake books too. The ones you know, pages. the one yeah, the, the non-real ones. Just click, click, click. Yeah, yeah right. And we right. have audiobooks too. Actually, audiobooks as well. So like you can, you know, you can you can now. Uh, two of my books have now been published as audiobooks. So you can, oh, do you, you read can them? Hear me read them to you. Yeah, oh, I'm I the love it when the author book. reads them. Oh, that's yeah. yes. Yeah, that's. So I've been reading Tom Holland's uh, Dominion, and I I've been reading the actual book, but I found out from um, other people in the book club that it's not him reading it, and I'm I'm, I'm like no, I can't. Can't. It has to be. No. Well, I listened to the rest of history, which is his podcast. So I'm like, well, I already know his voice too. Well, sorry, it just you've ruined podcast. The, the actual author, it's, you ruined it. Anyways, so for you, for you, that's that's why I'm so. I was like, great, you. It's your real voice. So okay, thank you for the uh, fantastic introductions here. So let's let's dive in because you. I'm actually really glad you made such a wonderful little outline. I'm not gonna have to really. Unless I'm interrupting for clarification, I'm not. It's a dream. It's the interviewer's dream. You've got it all ready, so I, I do appreciate that. But um, I've heard you talk about this a couple different times, both on the, Lo the Lord of Spirits podcast and Amon Sewell podcast, where and I I always want you to go on about it. So that's why I decided to just <laughs> like, hey, I have my own podcast slash YouTube channel. Let's. To have him on. So thank you so much also by agreeing to, to appear on my little YouTube channel. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to read this quote. It's um, from Chesterton. And I, you quoted it, I'm pretty sure, because that's where I got it from was from you. But you, yeah. So it's, it's only Christian men who protect even pagan things. So mm. that's the topic of today's discussion is some would call it syncretism. Some would call it, oh, the same thing, you know, integrating the local cultures into the conglomerate that, say, Rome could have done. And, and I know that there's the different gods um, that go between ancient Greece and ancient Egypt and just cultures sharing different things. So why is it different in Christianity? What is it that's happening? There's a lot of pagan things that can be found in the Christian world in Christendom and, and be, and before Christendom, like just, you know, so, so yeah, if you could go into that, that would answer my question. That'd be great. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think the first thing we should say, like, you know, w what did Chesterton mean by that? You know, that Christians preserve pagan things and only, you know, um, and and that is that with the exception of some things that are dug up by really ancient archaeology, um, almost everything that we have that describes the pagan world was either written by Christians or was specifically preserved by Christians. And in many cases, especially if you talk about texts, preservation of texts until the invention of printing meant that someone had to copy them by hand, mm -hmm. which it doesn't just mean like, oh, we found this amazing manuscript. We're going to keep it in this hermetically sealed box in the British Museum, you know, or the, you know, and, and, and that way we can preserve it. No, no, no. This was, this was people having to sit down and copy this stuff out by hand, which, to copy a, a, a book of any size, 
um, could take a very long time, right? So I, I think I remember, you know, my my, my Lord of Spirits co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, saying that, like, one of St. Paul's epistles, for instance, the, one of the bigger ones, would probably take about a month to copy out by hand. Um, really? You know, or or something like that, yeah. Um, it, it would kind of depend, you know, I, that, that in any event that it would be the, the roughly the, the modern equivalent of about, you know, four or five thousand dollars for one of the epistles of the New Testament. Right. Um, I might be getting the, the scale wrong here. But in any event, it's, you know, just think about how long it takes someone to to do that, to just sit there and write and, and write carefully, not just like scribble something out. But like the idea is I'm making a book. Right. Mm hmm. And so, you know, if someone's and, and scribes were were valuable people, right? Mm -hmm. they, they were skilled, you know, they, they had a lot of training and so forth. And so their time was worth money. And so that's why books were crazy expensive mm -hmm. in in the pre-modern world. Um, and so what you're talking about when you say, OK, we have, say, a copy of Homer, right? Uh, Homer's works. These are usually Christians and typically monks usually mm. Christian monks who sit down and decide to copy out the Iliad or the Odyssey or one of these kinds of texts. Mm. And so why would they do that? Yes, that, yes, <laughs> that is my question, sir. Why would they do that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so um, I know some people would look at that and say, man, you know, Christianity was such a mess before the modern period when we finally realized you shouldn't do that, <laughs> right? Um, Have we you realized know, you shouldn't do that? I, yeah, I, I, well, you know, some people would say you shouldn't do that. Uh, right. That's for sure. Right. Oh, right. I'm thinking of the, um, oh, who are those tracks? We're talking about Dungeons and Dragons and whatnot. Jack and Chick. The, yes. So, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jack, Chick tracks. Yeah. yeah. Those were an interesting piece of my childhood for sure. Right. Um, <laughs> one of them gave me nightmares for months. Which uh, one? one was it? Yeah, the it was called the. the it was one? no, not the oh. not the dark dungeons one, but it was one called the message, which was about someone who went to hell, because their Christian friend had never told them about Jesus, and they somehow got a letter back to their Christian friend saying it's your fault, that I'm burning in hell, and it had like images of. of and this hell. is for children, to read. Uh, I, I don't think that those tracks were necessarily for children, but certainly they were like usually out in the narthex at the church, you know, at various churches. So they were definitely within reach of children and it looked like a comic book. So like, yeah, that's yeah. No, it freaked me out. Cool. Re Super. Yeah. You're like, you're like eh, guys, I left evangelicalism and is it a wonder? <laughs> no. I'm, I'm no, a Protestant, I... just to be clear. But... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I didn't, I didn't leave because of that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just interesting yeah. history, sordid history. And so, Sure. So, great, great tangent, but yes. <laughs> but yeah, it was important. Right. It was important, friends. Right. So but, why would they yeah. do that? Right. Yeah. And and I think I think the, to understand why Christian monks would copy pagan texts, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and we'll get into it a little bit later. Not just why they would pres copy and preserve something, but actually produce new images of pagan things. Mm -hmm. Um. Why would they do that? I mean, number one, we also have to understand that like this antiquarian sense that we have these days of, look, I found this ancient thing. Let's put it in a museum. That is mostly I mean, there are some exceptions, but that's mostly not a thing in the ancient world. OK. Antiquarianism is is, is a is a, is a modern kind of I, idea. I mean, Victorian. Like I said, almost. Yeah, yeah. A little bit earlier than that. A oh, OK. Right. Right. That. You know, there, there was something especially called the folklore movement in the 19th century. And that was kind of falling on falling on uh, a lot of this. That sort of idea. OK. Um, I mean, there were a handful of museums in the ancient world, but but most of the museums as we now know them are a kind of modern invention, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, um, I think the biggest thing that we need to understand is that for ancient people, for pre-modern people in general, actually, not just ancient, even just pre-modern, whether you're talking in the, the pre-Christian era that's covered by the Old Testament or on up to you know, just a few centuries ago, the idea that the worship of the one true God, you know, so the, the life of Israel, whether you're talking about old covenant Israel or Israel as continued into the new covenant, that they did not see that as a fundamentally different uh, place than what was going on in paganism. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not two different worlds. 
right? Um, and uh, the reason why as modern people we tend to think that it uh, that way is because we tend to equate believing in the existence of a deity with being dedicated to that deity, right? So like, oh, okay. like there's a common sort of uh, atheist trope against Christians like, well, there's thousands of gods in the world, but you're telling me that you don't believe in any of them except one? Yeah. Right? And my response to that is, actually, I believe in all of them but I worship only one. Right. Because he's the only one who actually is worthy of worship. Right, okay. But the, the rest exist. The, the rest exist. Mm-hmm. And right. for uh, any clarification on that, friends, please check out uh, Lord of Spirits, particularly <laughs> true. the uh, earlier episodes on First the different pantheons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, I mean, if you just, just look at the Bible, there's no place where it says that the gods that the nations worship don't exist now there's all false kinds of... gods that's you that's what my memory is false right, and, right. and we don't but, know what false means what they by what they mean by false yeah when we say false god what me we what me tend to mean by it is a god that doesn't even exist mm -hmm. like it's a made-up story mm -hmm. right there's nowhere in scripture where they're treated that way right because if it's a made-up story then why would for instance saint paul say now, don't eat meat offered to idols because I don't want you in communion with demons. Right. If it's just a made up story, why would eating that stuff put you in communion with anything? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, you know, and there's there's multiple places of scripture where it says all of the gods of the nations are demons. Like it doesn't say all the gods of the nations are made up stories. Right. It says that they're they're demons. So they are real beings. Right. Um, Powers and so, principalities and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, yes. right. Fallen angels. I mean, we could get into all of that, but again, you oh, know, but you have a whole podcast, for that. podcast. <laughs> yeah. right? We do, we do, we literally do, <laughs> yeah. right? But but that's the key thing is is that it's not that there's a a, uh, a true story where none of these gods exist and there's only one god that exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then there's a false story that talks about lots of other gods. You know, these made up stories. Ancient peoples, including Israel, including the Church. You know, they all regarded their world as being inhabited by lots of spiritual beings. Okay. Lots of, right? So they're, in a sense, they're all in the same story. Mm. Now, there's different takes on that story. Like, how are you supposed to interpret the story? Or, or you know, like, well, what? here's what really happened, you know, in, in, in some cases. But, but nonetheless, um, it's really the same world that they're all in together, mm. right? And... Um, so then what's a lot of what's happening in the Bible, and actually I found this to be kind of a key, it's not a skeleton key, but it's a key to understanding a lot of what's going on in the Bible. A lot of what's in the Bible is actually designed to help people navigate that world correctly. Like, look, okay. you're going to meet a lot of spiritual beings out there mm. that are going to offer you things and you're going to say, I'm this or I'm that or whatever. Okay, this but, sounds like a, t a dad's talk to his teenage daughter. <laughs> Right. I yeah. have a teenage daughter, although I haven't. Given well, her I mean, it, it, you know, life it, it yeah. makes sense. It comes through. Uh, yeah. Although my daughter is very aware that there are a lot of demons in the world. I mean, yes, she has yes. to listen to dad talk all the time. Of course. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, in some ways that's what's going on in Scripture. Right. Our Heavenly Father is saying, look, um, you know, all that glitters is not gold. OK. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 you know, we'll talk in a second, a, a little bit later about why this is relevant to the modern world, but just to kind of, you know, give a, a, a sneak peek of that, there are a lot of people who act like if they have a kind of spiritual, direct spiritual experience with some kind of entity, that that must be good. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, and, and so what's happening in the scriptures is actually saying, look, um, there's a lot of spiritual beings out there but only one is actually worthy of being worshipped. Mm -hmm. Only one is worthy of your devotion. Only one is worthy of your obedience. Um, and and largely, what it does, what it says about the rest, is that they're weak. Mm. Like there's this constant sort of ridiculing uh, throughout Scripture of you know the gods of the nations. Like look how weak they are. They can't feed themselves. They can't clothe themselves. You expect they're going to give you good crops or victory in war? Please look how pathetic they are. Yeah, well, look up the uh, the Elijah or Saint Elias story. Right. In uh, which book is it? Shoot. Well, my my uh, Protestant knowing the my cake. Bible really well is falling it's in short. The 
books, yeah. In Kings. It's in the Kings books, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, Elias is a great example. So he's in the Northern Kingdom. He's he's engaging in a direct encounter with uh, paganism, worshiping a god named Baal. Mm -hmm. Right. And and and, you know, so he's kind of the patron saint of sarcasm. Right. Mm. You know? <laughs> Where's Baal? Is, is, mm -hmm. is he out relieving himself? Maybe yeah. he's on vacation. Maybe yeah. you need to shout louder, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's perfect. Yeah. It's, it, it's right. dripping with the sarcasm. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Sarcasm against pagan gods is A-OK -okay with the Bible. Right. And and that's the thing is people read through this modern lens, lens but these priests, like, they were taking it extremely seriously because they were oh. being, like, shown up. And that was humiliating. Right. right. This is life or death. This is not, you know, again, this also shows, like, how is religion understood in the ancient world? Um, in the modern world, like the fact that my neighbor has a different religion from me is not a threat in any way. Right. You know, it's not a threat. It's simply not. Um, unless I make it a, th a threat, I just sort of feel threatened by, it, you know. Yeah. But in the ancient world, religion and and your nation and your government and everything, your family, everything is one. I mean, it's all one thing. And so... That's why often religions, you know, were, like, for instance, the term Judeans is used in scripture. It doesn't just mean the people who live in Judea. It also refers to their whole way of life, including mm -hmm. their worship of Yahweh, the one true God. Mm -hmm. Right. So so religion is a big deal in the ancient world, a much bigger deal than it is now. And it's because there is no separation of religion and kind of anything else. It's all it just integral. is life. Right. Yeah, it's just life. It's just life, you know. They they didn't conceive of the idea of religion being a private thing that some people did, that was different from everybody else in their society. Mm -hmm. It's just not a way that it worked. Um, even you know, even the in in um, in Leviticus, where God gives commandments pertaining to non-Israel living in the midst of Israel, uh, you know, God doesn't outright say, "Look, you have they all have to be circumcised and brought into the covenant." Covenant, we can't have those non-Israelites living here. But there still is like, okay, these are the rules for non-Israelites living in your midst. They cannot mm -hmm. engage in idolatry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, it's not religious freedom. No. They, they, in other words, they can't worship their gods right. while they're with you. We're mm -hmm. not going to make them worship Yahweh. We're not going to make them do that. But they better not be engaging in idolatry while they're here, right. you know, yeah. or 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 sexual immorality or other stuff. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a list of, of, of specific expectations, right? So. You know, this is the world that they're living in, and um, there's there's three responses that you see in Scripture to um, the fact that the worship of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one true God, is bumping up against the worship of these other gods, right? There's mm -hmm. there's three ways it's kind of dealt with, right? And uh, the fact that you find them in Scripture doesn't mean that God endorses all of them. <laughs> Right, right. You know, right. There's, there's all kinds of things that people do in, in the Bible that, that that does not have the divine stamp of approval. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and so one of one of them then is is this question of syncretism. Right. So mm -hmm. this is this is the lens through which modern American. I don't know about Canadian, but American Christians. North American. This, we'll just North American. There we go. Yes, we'll use that term. It's a very artificial word. <laughs> Why is North American mean Canadians and, and you know, I know what about the Mexicans? And almost never Mexican, right? Hello. I know. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're anyway, just a bunch of um, bad people. Anyways, but the lens that the, the, the lens when when we see uh, pagan stuff and Israel stuff together in in the modern world, we tend to think syncretism. We, our minds just go straight to that, mm -hmm. and that's in there. Mm -hmm. So that's in there, right? So there's there's a lot of examples. And what's funny about this, I was just having a conversation about this the other day. What's funny about this is that sometimes, you know, archaeologists will like they'll dig up the the uh, the remnants of pagan shrines and stuff like that in the in the area where Israel was and they'll say mm -hmm. oh look at this this contradicts what we see in the bible you know it, it, you know the bible depicts Israel as mono as unitarian monotheists and and yet wow we dug up the you know, we dug up these these pagan altars and shrines yeah. here like ah no, no. you know Israel straight a lot nope yeah, <laughs> there's yeah, a lot no, of string like, like, like have you read the bible yeah <laughs> They, because, they leave a lot in regards to right, their faith. Right. 
<laughs> right, right. So like, uh, you know, there's a number of examples of this, you know, with Israel actually engaging in pagan worship, right? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the number one example is the golden calf mm -hmm. that while Moses is off talking to God, Aaron is down there with the people at the bottom of the mountain and they come up with, you know, they, they make this golden calf. Now they, they identify the calf as being Yahweh. Oh, they right? do. So, oh, yeah. This that. is this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. So they're basically trying to say, you know, this is a body of Yahweh, right? Because this is how paganism, idolatry works, right? right? So yeah, so so it's not like they they were actually not trying to invent a new god, but they were trying to worship the one true God in, in a, a pagan, pagan idolatrous manner. Oh, okay, okay. Right, right, exactly. So, but you know. It gets way worse, right? So eventually when Israel gets split up into the northern and southern kingdoms, uh, the northern kingdom has a number of, of these golden calf statues in various high places and so forth. And uh, sometimes they say that they're worshiping Yahweh. Other times, you know, especially when you get into the, the Ahab and Jezebel era, they are openly worshiping Baal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like this does exist. Um, but then even, you know... <laughs> Even the son of, of David, Solomon, right, he engages in syncretism too. He actually sets up shrines in the courts of his of the temple to Yahweh. He mm -hmm. sets up shrines in those courts that are dedicated to a local Canaanite god who is called Shemesh Tzedakah, right? So Shemesh is... Uh, although it doesn't say when Solomon sets him up, it just says that he sets up these idolatrous shrines. But later on, when King Josiah, who is one of the two good kings, mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, when he tears them down, it actually then identifies who these shrines are to, right? That's in okay. Second Kings 20, right? Um, in case anyone's thinking, wait, when when Solomon set the shrines, it doesn't say who they're to, right? But 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 they're, they're identified in this way uh, when, when King Josiah tears them down. So mm -hmm. Shemesh is a Canaanite uh, sun god, you know, like the sun in the sky, okay? Mm -hmm. And in fact, the the word it's the name itself means sun, okay. Okay. But it's but it's, it's worshipped as a deity, right? And then uh, Tzedaka or Tzedek is um, a a local instantiation to use complicate you know to use the specific uh, theological term a local hypostasis of Shemesh. So he's a okay. local instantiation of Shemesh there in uh, Jerusalem. Oh, okay. So they would like to be worshipped. Yes, exactly. Okay. Like, like this is our local Shemesh. Yeah. You know, he, he's he's one he's one being, but but there's this local uh, body of his, local instantiation of his mm -hmm. um, there. And so, this is what's being worshipped in Jerusalem before um, before David, and you know, takes it and, and so forth. And so, what Solomon does is he basically revives the worship of this this pagan deity mm. and includes it in the temple to, to their God, to just being inclusive people. Yeah. We're just including. Right. So yeah. this is, and, and, and syncretism is not when you've got images from things that are kind of together. These, this is, these are actual shrines where the God is being worshiped with sacrifices and, and also with veneration, like mm -hmm. sacrifices are being offered to this God. People are in communion with this God. Mm -hmm. That's, this is real syncretism. Okay. Right. Um, so, so yeah, that does happen. And um, it's, it's, it's never approved of by God. He's very clearly says, I'm a, I'm a jealous God. You shall have no other gods before me, which doesn't mean in priority before me, although that's true. It means in front of me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I get okay. that out of sight. Okay. Uh, so I don't want to interrupt you because I know there's, I know, I know there's much to get to, but I, I, I am curious as to why some things, it's a big no-no, do not bring in these other things into my temple, do not worship me as a calf, do, you know, don't do that. But you can preserve other things later sometimes, uh, you, you know, uh, that's okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm like, where, where's the line? How do we know what's okay to preserve and what's not okay? Right. So there's a difference between preservation and syncretism. Okay. Okay. Um, and I would even say like that, that most of the people who are incorporating in some way pagan imagery or stuff into Israel, 
um, you know, are not even, they wouldn't even think of it as preservation. Again, it's simply part of their world. Okay. Right. It's not like, oh, look, I dug up this whole thing. Let's make sure we keep it safe. Right. Okay. It's They're simply participating part of, with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's all okay. part of the world. Right. It's all part of their world. Right. So the, the, there's a number of things you could describe as being the line, but here, the big bright line is don't worship them. Mm -hmm. Don't worship other gods. Okay. You know, you're only allowed to be in communion with, with Yahweh. Okay. Everything else, no. And here's, here's why. So um, anything else that accepts worship is in rebellion against him. Right. And, and you become like the one you worship. So if you're worshiping a demon, you become like that demon. I mean, mm -hmm. for ancient pagans, this was not a bug. It was a feature. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm worshiping Aries, it's because I want to be really tough in battle. If I'm worshiping mm -hmm. Aphrodite, it's because I want to be glorious and really great at seduction. You know, mm -hmm. like that's that's the point. You know, like they they want that to happen. Um, you know what 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 the Bible is saying is like actually you don't want that to happen because that's really bad for you. Mm. You know, because you might think it's just about being tough in battle, but actually you are in communion with a with a demon, and that's going to destroy you. In mm. fact, mm -hmm. it doesn't just make you or beautiful or successful or whatever, right? So, yeah, it's it's like, in some ways, it's like doing drugs, you know, like people do speed. Do they still call it speed anymore? That's what they called it in the 80s. Uh, I'm, uh, well, uh, you're asking the wrong gal. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I was never a drug guy either. Uh, <laughs> happy to hear you're not. Um, yeah, you're just like, oh, this is grew up in a very a sheltered a Southern Baptist household in Canada, so, yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. yeah. But I mean, you know, people people did it because they or cocaine sometimes because they believe it was going to give them an advantage. Right. Uh, it's going to make them stronger, smarter, faster, whatever, uh, more productive, but actually is destroying them. Right. Right. Actually, it's destroying them. It's, I mean, it's essentially the same kind of thing. Right. And so then there are two responses that you see in Scripture that are actually done by holy people. Right. So people who are on board with God, who are actually worshiping him, doing his will. Right. Um, so you've got um, you've got then the, the one that probably makes the most sense to modern people, which is this direct opposition of the ancient gods. Mm -hmm. um, so if someone actually accepts that these other beings exist and that they're bad, then it makes sense then to go to war against them. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've got this this direct uh, opposition. And one way that human beings do it, especially certain kings, is they'll tear down idols. They'll, you know. Right. Take down the high places. Take down yeah. the Exactly. Right, right. You know, so like we said, the King Josiah took down what Solomon had built inside the temple of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a thing. And, you know, this continues on, you know, even into the Christian era. Right. So, uh, you know, St. Nicholas. Right. Santa Claus. Um, yep. You know, most people know him as the gift giver. Uh, Didn't snarky, he punch someone at an account? Internet people know him as the Arius puncher. <laughs> yes. But to me, he's way more interesting as the 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 scourge of demons. Um, oh. Oh yes, there's multiple stories about Saint Nicholas as a scourge of demons. Um, so there's, for instance, one case where there was a particular tree that was inhabited by demons, and he went and cut it down. This is very similar to the story about Saint Boniface in Germany, who cut down a sacred oak, an oak sacred to Thor. You know, oh, and when, so okay. when Saint Nicholas, when the story goes about Saint Nicholas, and he cut it down, and he was praying, of course, the whole time, that the demons that were inhabiting it literally screamed as they ran away. You oh. know, and then and yeah, and then Saint Nicholas also um, he would sometimes stand outside pagan temples because in his diocese there were still a lot of pagan temples. So when was he? When was fourth his... century? Fourth century. Oh, oh, okay. So, yeah. so yeah. this is you know paganism is 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 in the process of really ending at that point, but it's not gone. It's still mm -hmm. a very present concern. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are icons of him, for instance, cutting down idols. Mm. Right. Um, but he would also stand outside pagan temples and, sh and through the sheer force of his prayer, sometimes the the altar to the, that God would fall over and crash into dust. Other times mm. the whole building would just come down just like he had wow. you know, pressed some big demolition button. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so, the you Holy know, Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, on, on a spiritual level, what was happening, if you could see everything happening is. St. Nicholas is there praying and, a, and God sends a bunch of angels who then go smash and, you know, demolish the building. Mm -hmm. So, 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 he, you know, this is, this is one of these things that you see. And, you know, this is, um, this is a theme that is 
that is uh, present in terms of how God himself is depicted in the Bible. So okay. God, you know, God directly opposes and smashes and destroys demons. Right. Right. So like, you know, in, in, in Exodus chapter 12, for instance, where the plagues are about to come upon the Egyptians, um, there's this line in Exodus 12 that says, where God says, I'm, I am judging the gods of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Like when he's about to send the plagues, he doesn't, he doesn't say, I'm about to lay the smack down on the Egyptians because look how terrible they are. He says, I'm judging the gods of Egypt. And of course, mm -hmm. then that affects the whole country mm -hmm. because they serve those gods. They mm -hmm. are part of that God, those gods community. Those gods are part of their community. So mm -hmm. he says, I'm judging the gods of Egypt, which means he's bringing justice against them and setting things to right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's that's one that's one way that's happening. Um, you also see it in a broader way, like in uh, Psalm 82, where the first line, it says, God stands up in the council of the gods and renders judgment. And then if you read the rest of the psalm, then it, it, then he basically starts listing off the charges against them. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, look, I told you to to help the weak and to, to take care of people, but you oppress them. You just, you know, you destroyed the widow and the orphan. Like you did all these awful things to them. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the last part is where it says, arise, O God, and judge the earth for to thee belong all the nations. You know, so there's a sense mm -hmm. of like, you've been judged and found wanting and justice is being rendered. All of the dominion that you had now is being taken away from you mm. and being given back to Christ, the Christ who is the God who arises, right? So you yeah. see that like Psalm 82 is a great, a great example of this, this direct opposition of demons by God himself, right? Is this in your book? That is, yes, yes. So the book is titled, Arise, O God is... I'm like, is that actually, sounds familiar. I believe that yes. is the title of your latest book, sir. Indeed, yes. So the, the you know, the, the, the epigraph or epigram, I'm never sure which one it is, at the beginning <laughs> is Psalm 82. Like the whole psalm okay. is just included there. And of course, the mm -hmm. book is called Arise, O God. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, it is about this, this direct opposition against demons, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and another great example is Psalm 24, where... You get the the final lines, you know, lift up your gates, so ye princes be lifted up, ye everlasting gates, and the king of glory will enter in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in war. So there's this idea that 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 the Son of God is invading Hades directly and smashing down his power because mm. in the ancient world, the underworld and the God who ruled it had the same name because they were understood as essentially being the same kind of reality. To be right. in the underworld, to be in death, was to be in the power of the god of death. Right. right? Which okay, which, yeah, that I mean, shows that 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 they're so connected. It's not yeah. the one is separate. Like yes, one is a sort of manifestation of the concept, but we've we've used our modern language to place that to so we can understand what exactly that was. Right. Because it, it just was. Like they just existed in right. it. Right. Right. Like like the Epistle of the Hebrews. You know, Saint Paul says describes the devil as the one who has the power of death. Mm. Right? Like okay. he doesn't say, and there's this concept called death, you know, mm -hmm. like it's, 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 it's directly about being in the power of a demon. Right. Uh, you know, and, and so then again, like if it's just an imaginary figure, then why does, as, as it says in one of John's epistles, it says that, you know, Christ, he, the son of God came to the world to destroy the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. like, why would he do that? <laughs> If if the if the devil's not a thing, you know, or the god, you know, these gods of the nations are not not a thing. So right. this is a sense of direct opposition, and so you get you get God doing it, you get human beings doing it. Mm -hmm. um, this makes a lot of sense once you accept right. the reality of these things. And clearly, you know, Saint Nicholas standing outside a temple and praying that it be crumbled into dust, and hearing the screams of demons, he knows that they're real. He mm -hmm. accepts their reality. In fact, the thought probably doesn't cross his mind. I wonder if they're really real. Of course, he sees he sees right. them. Like he has the spiritual sight to actually see them and interact with them. It's pretty crazy, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not going to be praying for that. Um, no, ability. no, not a good idea. I'm, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm 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 happy to not be um, gifted in such a way. But man, the like, people who are good good luck good yeah. blessings. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a serious responsibility. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, big time, and massive temptations and 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 you know attacks and 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 all that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. There's one thing to kind of understand these things, and to live the ordinary life of the Christian in a vivified way in response to them. Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to be like, okay, I'm going to be like a ghostbuster. 
Mm. You know, like, no, not a good idea, you know. No, you've uh, you got know. to be very called, probably called for this. Yeah, and so, so yeah, we're going, yeah, so, so, so you, so this is the one, so there's another response that's a, yeah, that also? Yeah, right, right. So, okay. so this is the one that, now this is the one that confuses people. <laughs> yes, okay. And, and that's, that's where pagan images and stories are actually co-opted, incorporated mm -hmm. into not just what worshipers of God are doing and talking about and so forth, but God himself makes use of pagan imagery in talking about himself, right? Not Now, okay. not just like these other gods are real, I'm going to oppose them. I mean, that's there. But but actually, he he uses, when he's inspiring his prophets to talk about him, he actually uses this language uh, from pagan sources in order to describe himself. And I'll just give a few examples, right? Okay. okay so, you know, we're, we're, you know, Christians are familiar with the image of Christ coming riding on the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of places where you see this in, in the book of Daniel, where there's this image of the ancient of days. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes in on the clouds and then he's enthroned, you know? Um, and then, and then the same kind of image happens in, um, in in stuff in the New Testament, where it talks about, you know, the Lord coming back in the way in which he he uh, ascended into heaven. He's coming riding on the clouds, right? And of course, there's lots of you know Christian iconography of of Christ sort of standing on clouds. Like this is so much a big thing that a lot of people's vision of what heaven is is about people Riding on clouds, clouds little, little happy hearts. angels sitting on some yeah, some exactly, clouds. exactly. Yeah. So this is from Baal. Oh. Right. Huh. This is a Baal image. Okay. Right? Baal is described in his own, and you can read it. I mean, like the Baal cycle, which is the sort oh, of Oh, yeah. I always go Baal. reading about the Baal totally. cycle, like, yeah. often. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all on the internet. You can look it up, actually. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, translations of it are on the internet. So you can, okay. you can go read it in English. Uh, in case you don't happen to read Ugaritic. I mean... It's not, it wasn't in my like high school, uh, you know, Spanish, Ugaritic. Like, I chose Spanish. Like, what it's... What do they teach in uh, kids in schools these days? <laughs> I know. Yeah. But not, yeah Ugaritic, so this... not Ugaritic, but yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This this notion that that the that Baal is the cloud rider, he's the one. I mean, and which makes sense because Baal is a thunder storm god. Mm -hmm. So of course he's going to come riding on the clouds, whatever. That image is taken and applied to the Son of God in the Bible. Oh, okay, and they would have known this. Oh yeah. 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 So so the point of that is to say, no no no, Baal isn't the real cloud rider. He's not the one who actually controls the weather. You know. Mm -hmm. That's the son of the Most High God. This is, you know, and of course, clearly then revealed in the New Testament, this is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's the real cloud rider. He's the one who, you know, that even the wind and the waves obey him, simply obey him. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, this is one of the things that stuns his disciples when he's, they're on the boat together. And they're like, who is this guy that the wind and waves simply obey him? Mm -hmm. Right? That's an important point because... In, in, in most um, pagan images of gods who control things like the weather, they have to defeat usually some other spiritual being in order to be able to wrest control of, of these elements from them. Mm. With Christ, it's no contest. Right. Zero contest. With, with God, it's always just, look, no contest. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, the, you know, the, the, the arm wrestling uh, contest where it just goes boom. Yeah. Like there's right. no like there's no struggle. There's nothing. It's right. just simply boom, they have to obey. They just have to obey, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's one example is you know, Christ on clouds, again, in the Bible, prophetic inspiration, that's from the, the Baal story. Would would right? is that the right way to say the like reappropriating it to its proper place? Yeah. So what's being revealed then is like, actually, you know what, Baal worshippers and Baal yourself, you know, you stole this. Yeah. This you stole this from art. us. <laughs> yeah. Right. This is, uh, yeah, exactly. It's not like Christians, you know, now the way that we perceive it is that there's this pagan image that gets co-opted, you know, by mm. Israel. But but the reality is, is that this usurper, mm. this usurping demon is claiming something that doesn't actually belong to him. You know, and so so when that image is then taken by Israel and by God himself, it's it's. 
it's actually to say um, wrong, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. false. Mm -hmm. This actually belongs to me, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so that's part of that's the dynamic that's going on there, right? So another another great example, and this one is even more shocking. Mm. Oh, right? you might oh, be shocking okay, me, please. Cl yes. Clouds, oh yeah. Well, you, you know, like like okay, clouds, you know, cloud rider. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. U Ugaritic, All right. All right. ancient Ugaritic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, he. I, I can accept that he controls the weather. Fine, you know, yeah. Christ controls the weather. I mean, he clearly controls the weather. Um, but here's one that's even more shocking. Okay, so I mentioned earlier this local deity that was being worshipped in Jerusalem and that Solomon brought the worship of into the courts of Yahweh's temple, and that's this mm -hmm. deity called Shemesh uh, Tzedakah. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Um, well, but, I'm, but so many YouTube comments will be coming in, you know, critiquing yeah, yeah. it, but, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Hello, ancient Canaanites. Glad to <laughs> yeah. welcome you to the YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm glad you could let us know how this yeah, is pronounced. Yeah, glad you came back to <laughs> right, critique right. Father so, Andrew. So, yeah. you know, again, I mentioned Shemesh is the sun god. And then, so Tzedekah or Tzedek, um, which, uh, spoiler alert, actually is a, an element in the name for Melchizedek, Melki Tzedek. Oh, but okay. To, to know, yeah, yeah, yeah. For oh, So I, I'm just saying that because uh, Lord of Spirits were actually... When we're recording this, Lord of Spirits is about to have an episode on Melchizedek. So right, because you just uh, went over Abraham and then Melchizedek. Yeah, we're doing yeah, we're doing Melchizedek next. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So actually, a lot of what we're talking about today uh, is very relevant to that the Melchizedek episode. So okay. uh, it's just on my mind. So it just made for good material for this as well. Mm -hmm. um, so so Shemesh Tedeka, sorry. So Shemesh means is is a sun god's name, and it means the sun as well, like the sun of the sky. Uh, but tzedakah actually also means righteousness or justice. Mm. But again, this is this local instantiation of this version of Shemesh. So this is the name of a pagan god as he's being worshipped in ancient uh, Jerusalem. And then even uh, even in then in, in when Solomon, you know, brought him in or whatever. That name, mm -hmm. Shemesh tzedakah, is simply stolen completely from there and then applied. Um, I think it's in, is it Malachi? Yeah, I think it's Malachi. Applied then to the Son of the Most High God, he is simply called by this name, and then. But what happens then is it should be understood as a translation of the name, or an understanding of the name by its by its the words that it means, which is oh. Son of Justice or Son of Righteousness. Okay, so it's almost like a pun would you say like two meanings like where like well, the, it's well, a yeah. name and it means something yeah i mean all of those things at once because again for an ancient pagan the sun and the sky and the sun god you worshiped were the same the sun in the yeah. sky was a body of the sun god you worshiped yeah okay that's how integrated it is so why would they why would why would they use that so you know why why would pagans use that or why would No, that... why would the oh. why would Malachi write it in such a way? It's to say that that the son of God is the real son of righteousness. Okay, and not He's to get mixed up with the justice. word son in English everyone just to be clear. S -O -N. So, yes. It's just a happenstance. S -O -N, yes, unfortunately S O N and S U N in English are homophones. Yeah. Um, but but no, it's son S U N of justice or of righteousness. Um, justice and righteousness are the same concept in the scripture, right? right? It's to make things right, setting things right, and then righteousness is living according to that. You okay. Know, but it's the same basic concept. So the idea is that he's the real one who is, uh, who who is the son of of you know the one who shines justice and righteousness on the world, and mm. you know. It's not like they couldn't have used some other way of expressing this concept. Right. It was particular. But but the prophet specifically, under the inspiration from God, specifically chose this pagan God name to refer to the Son of God. Again, it's saying, you usurper, mm -hmm. this does not belong to you. This right. actually belongs to the son of the most high God. And then of course that line son of, of justice or son of righteousness gets incorporated, at least in the Orthodox tradition, gets incorporated into, to Orthodox hymnography. Right. So like the, the, the main hymn, the main uh, hymn, the Apolitikian for the feast of the nativity of Christ for Christmas includes this phrase, son of mm. justice mm. right in there. So right. we're continuing. It's not like, okay, Malachi, that was a little much. We're going to kind of back off from that. No, it's like, it's no, like no, we're no. okay with this. We're going to sing it for 2000 years, at least, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so that phrase, son of justice gets used by Christians very explicitly because they see it in Malachi 
And while it may have been forgotten that belonged that this is a name of a pagan god, the concept is retained, and it doesn't get sort of purified out. You know, like oh, we need to clean any reference to any kind of paganism. You know, because um, it's right. the way that paganism is being handled. The way, okay, right. so okay, I have a, I, I do have a question here. So I remember doing a not an official study, but just like a, a looking through the book of Daniel and the names that the three youths along with Daniel um, mean a praise to the different oh, Babylonian yeah. gods. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. so they accept those. They actually, it doesn't, they don't reject the names, but they do reject the food and they reject bowing down to the idol. So that's what, right. so I mean, honestly, we were like, I guess some in their discernment, they're okay with this, but not this. I don't know why though. So again, there's sort of a line of, well, that's actually just idolatry. So we won't do that. Or we, that's, that'll make us impure. We won't eat that. But we are okay with these names praising the Babylonian gods. And I don't know how to know why is that okay and not the other. Yeah. And some of them are what they call uh, theophoric, which means it actually incorporates the name of a god. So the mm -hmm. obvious yeah. example, for instance, is like Daniel gets called Belshazzar. Yeah. So that bell at the beginning is Baal. Right. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. That's actually incorporated into it. So notice where exactly they draw the line. It's not just about what I'm having for dinner. In the ancient world, meat, if there was meat on the table, it had been sacrificed to a god. Okay. Uh, almost never was it like, let's just have hamburger for dinner, dear. That's mm -hmm. just not, not a thing, you know. Uh, you know, when you've got this amazing food, you're going to offer it to your god to get the advantage that you would get from doing that. Right. And then you would eat it in communion with your God. So, you know, notice that it's about food, right? And of course, also notice that they're not going to bow down to that image. Right. So that would have been syncretism if they had done those things. But the name, right. they're being called this name and responding to it daily. Right, because they have, they have no problem. So, for instance, I'll give you the example. I, I don't know what Belshazzar means in full, but Baal actually, um, you know, Baal just means Lord. It just means a lord or a master, right? And so uh, let's say, again, I do not know exactly what Belshazzar means. I have I didn't get a chance to look it up. You surprised me with this. I one. know. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just it's one okay. in my head <laughs> that's, uh, I I, well, what about this, Father Andrew? Yeah, right. Ha ha. I yeah. have notes you know not of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, let's say it means like praise be to Baal or something like that, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, Daniel could easily have said, well, that means praise be to the Lord. And of course, my Lord, I only have one Lord, and that's that's Yahweh, right? But couldn't so, you say that about you know, the food? Well, we know there's only one God who this should have been sacrificed to because he's the real, true God. But it, like, but it wasn't sacrificed to him. It was sacrificed to those demons. You okay. see? So, you you know, you can't, you can't just simply reinterpret. Like you can you, reinterpret words, but you can't reinterpret a sacrifice. Not in the same way in any event. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, St. Paul gets into this, like, like if someone serves you something and you don't know that it's been offered to a, a, a demon, you know, you know, pray over it, give thanks to God and eat it. That's what he says. Right. But if they say, you know, this is fresh from our sacrifice to Zeus, you know, your response is supposed to be, I'll have some broccoli, you know, <laughs> Uh, that's, right. That's okay. Okay. But okay. I was. Assuming you mentioned the broccoli this earlier. wasn't offered to Zeus. Well, I'm you know. <laughs> right. I'm. I'm Although kind of confused about when um, Saint Paul talks about don't like if if you know it's perfectly fine to eat meat from idols, but if it's a stumbling block to your brother. Sorry, I'm getting into the weeds because I'm like, wait, yeah, doesn't yeah, he say this? Yeah. So, so does it depend this on the region? Weed. Um. So. The, the 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 reason why it can become a stumbling block is because it might draw your brother into idolatrous worship. But why is it right? okay so for you what, if you're okay that's with what it? The weakest weaker brother is. It's not it's not like okay I can do anything I like. That's not what Saint Paul is saying actually. In fact, he explicitly says if you know that this has been offered to idols, do not eat it because I don't want you to have communion with demons. Right. He doesn't say if you know this has been offered to idols, but no one is watching, go ahead and eat it. Okay. You know, so so he does explicitly say that, you know, don't eat stuff that, you know, has been offered to idols. Right. 
Um, so, but yeah, the point being, don't draw either way. Don't draw yourself or your brother into the worship of of of, uh, of idols, the worship of demons. So, am I you know, making it up that he says that it, even though you know it's okay? Don't basically, be something says, he doesn't say you know it's okay. He just says, don't use the freedom that you have in Christ for this. Okay, okay. So yeah. that was totally a segue of wait, but what about right. this? So no, I apologize. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. Basic rule. Don't eat things offered to demons. Just a really okay. easy rule to follow. <laughs> but if so. your name corresponds with a particular lowercase g god or demon, that can be reappropriated back to God. Uh, yeah, potentially, yeah. I mean, and, okay. I mean, sometimes it's sometimes it's not sim some like in some cases, for instance, you've got um, uh, you've got saints who literally have names of pagan gods. Like oh, Dionysus. Apollo, Dionysius, Athena. I mean, it goes on and I mean, it's just the Greek names, right? Um, you know, um, and, and um, or even like sometimes it gets super integrated, right? So I'll give you an example. So in the Romanian language, the, the general word for God is domnuzeo. Now, I'm sure if any Romanians are tuning in, they're probably like, that's not how you say that. I'm sorry. But as far as I know, Domnoseo. So, <laughs> but if you if you pull apart, pull that apart etymologically, the first part means Lord. Okay, no problem. I can call God that. But the less, the latter part, Zeo, actually comes from Zeus. So literally, oh! the word of God that's used by Romanian Christians, Orthodox Christians, means Lord Zeus. But what's happened? And in fact, you know, the rabbit hole goes even deeper. The same root from which you get Zeus, Deus, Deo, is also Deus in Latin. I've seen this Deus, YouTube video, Father Greek. Andrew. Oh, I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I haven't seen <laughs> no, this YouTube video, but, 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 yeah, but yeah. etymologically, they're all kind of one. Like every single word for God, actually, that's used by any Christian was the name of a pagan god. Okay. So it's not even just like Christians accepting names and trying to struggle with it. Literally, we're using the the words that were used for pagan gods to refer to the one, the one true God Yahweh. You okay. cannot escape it. Every single word for God that's out there, like like some people, like for instance, like to look at the Arabic word Allah, and they'll mm -hmm. say, you know, see, Allah is this other God. You know, there's this there's this moon God that you know that this was used for this. Actually, it's like no, actually. Allah is just the Arabic word that means God. Yes, it did apply to a moon god at one point, but Arabic-speaking Christians have used Allah since there were Arabic-speaking Christians, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. for basically 2,000 years. Um, you know, it's just simply the word for God. But yeah, you can't escape calling God by a name that was once applied to a pagan god. Okay. Okay. In, in no, I don't. I'm not aware. I mean, it's possible, but I'm not aware of any language where the word that's used for God or any word that's used for God was not at some point applied to some demonic pagan deity. I mean, probably Pro Klingon, but like, you know. Probably Klingon, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, okay. that's a con lang, so. Okay, yeah. you yeah, know yeah. more about it than I do. <laughs> The other one, the other one I wanted to, the other example I wanted to give was okay. where a piece of story actually gets reappropriated. Okay, please. Right, so this is the last, yeah, in, in another co-opting thing, but it's a piece of story. So so in, in, in the Baal story, so again, this is very present for ancient Israel. In the Baal story, uh, Baal has to fight the gods of the ocean and the rivers in order to put him and his father up on top as the new most high god and his son, right? Right. Um, so those, 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 be, those uh, gods are called Yam and Nahar, which just happen to be the Semitic words for oceans and rivers mm -hmm. uh, also. And um, Psalm 24, it says that that God made the made everything and that he founded the earth upon the waters. Mm -hmm. This is actually a direct oh. response to the Baal thing. It basically says, it doesn't say God God fought with the, the ocean and the rivers and won. It just mm -hmm. simply says, boom. He just, he just smacks down the earth. <laughs> he just... He just flattened it, you know. Yeah. And then yeah. what's interesting then is like in 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 the book of Revelation, uh, when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down, it, it lands sort of on this this sea, but it's a sea of glass. There's in, there's no resistance at all. Right. It's, right. It's yes. Totally yeah. Yeah. So. So. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Because there's there was resistance in that Baal story. Right, right, right. Again, there's okay. this question that he has to struggle or whatever, and they have to fight against other gods in order to win. You right. know, God takes the same story and says, no, this is actually how the story went. Right, okay. He puts that in the mouth of his prophet. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not someone's response. This is this is God himself speaking through the prophet. Right. You know? uh, so this is Psalm 24. So that's right there at the beginning of that psalm. Okay, so yeah. 
have we moved into Christendom from the Old Testament? Or are we? Sure, um, right, right. Gonna, okay, right. Like, uh, so, wherever you, you have, whatever your notes say, we'll, we'll go. No, I mean, it's not a lecture, hopefully, you know, but I. No, I, no, I, 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 no, I, I, I said, I'm like, yay, I don't have to do too much. I just get to and take it in. I, so. I try to be prepared, especially, I mean, I'll be honest, like you are the first person to ever ask me to talk about this. And that is the best compliment I could ever get as, a, as an interviewer. Well, because you talk about, that's actually one of the reasons why. I mean, I've listened to Lord of Spirits since the first episode. And yes, it would, whoops, yes, it would be nice to be like, hey, these guys have a new podcast. I should try to get them to talk about it. But I, I prefer to wait until I have something that is nagging at me that I'm like, I need to know this thing yeah. rather than, hey, tell me about this podcast that you've talked about a little bit <laughs> already to other podcasters, you know, right. um, in other interviews. Yeah. So that's why I'm really glad that Actual I know content. for you, you're like, it's unpracticed, but I'm like, yay, it's different and new because no, that's what my, well, I mean, my goal I'm, is. I'm, I'm actually working on a book now where this is probably going to be a chapter. So, oh, great. Uh, OK. Yeah. yeah you're yeah, welcome yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, <laughs> Thank you. No, I just yeah. no, but it, it is it is something that I'm I'm glad that it it's it's a unique topic because I know you can talk about the same things over again. Sure. So. Yeah, and yes. I mean this is not something that a lot of people think too much about. Um, mm. But then when they encounter it, it becomes kind of like an issue. And I'll I'll give you an example. So you mentioned Amon Sewell, which is my Tolkien podcast that I do with Richard Rowland, um, who's been an awesome addition to the podcast. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes people look at the, they, they realize that Tolkien uses pagan imagery in his works and they're like, oh, you know, like, oh, syncretism, you know, like how, yeah. how can this guy claim to be Christian? And there's even like a whole world out there who's like, Tolkien was really a pagan. And mm. um, some people who, who like condemn him for that and others are like, yes, we're pagans. Tolkien's a pagan. Wow, he's really right. a pagan. Different you know? ends kind of taking it. And, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. But so, you know, so it does come up in some of the conversations that I have, although not super deeply, not like we're getting to do it today. Mm. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I want to suggest that what Tolkien is doing is actually this, what we're mm -hmm. talking about, because okay. he's firmly in the Christian tradition, if you understand it clearly. Right. So like one obvious place to look for that is uh, a poem that that is deeply influential for Tolkien, and that's Beowulf. Mm -hmm. And of course, Beowulf has pagan elements in it. Very mm. clearly. In fact, so much so that some people claim it was a pagan poem that Christians later edited and added mm. stuff to whatever. But okay. if that's the case, the editing job was so thorough that the original version uh, is completely obscure. <laughs> you know? Right. More more reasonable is that it was written by a Christian. Okay. Who deliberately included these pagan elements. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So that so, is the perfect example right. of so what Right. So that's kind of what we're is. talking yeah. about. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't want to get too much into Beowulf just because, um, number one, it's on my mind. So I could just completely get lost in that. Right. Uh, cause I'm, I'm taking a Beowulf class in old English right now, which is okay. as awesome as it sounds, but as scary as it sounds too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear the, uh, the, the awesomeness along, well, the, the, the fear of the awesomeness. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I'm afraid of how awesome it is. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but OK, so but anyways, but sort of from some of the kind of same cultural world. OK, so northern Europe um, and northern Christian Europe, early northern Christian Europe, uh, which is a, an area that I'm really interested in. Um, but a lot of these things actually will apply in other Christian regions if you look at it. OK, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to pick some that are kind of from that area, some examples from that area. OK, OK. And so then one I wanted to talk about. Um, and I just want to go over each of these briefly, but these are just examples. Um, one is, 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 again, I do not speak Norwegian, mm -hmm. but it's the Hilestad Stave Church. So that's spelled H-Y-L-E-S-T-A-D, okay? Okay. Um, and a stave church is a particular kind of, of church architecture that exists uh, in, essentially in Scandinavian areas, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and... On, this church was built probably sometime 12th, 13th century in, in, in Norway. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. It was torn down, um, you know, several hundred years after that. There are other stave churches that exist even now that are still standing. So that's great. Um, so you can actually go and, and you know, look at them and, and tour them and stuff. Um, 
and um, which I haven't gotten a chance to do that. I, I hope someday I will get to. Um, mm -hmm. I understand there actually is a stave church here in North America, which was kind of built, you know, not it's not ancient. Uh, I'm like, was it the Viking? I, oh no, they wouldn't have built a no, church, no, of course. No, no, no. Oh. I think it was. I think when it's in. Came. I think it's in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan or somewhere in that part uh, of, okay. of the United States. Um, so um, if I remember correctly, I have to go look this. Or maybe it was Wisconsin, somewhere in that region. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so this was torn down, but a, a piece of it was saved. Oh, okay. And that's, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so if you were to walk up to the church while it was still standing, you would see right in front of the, the outer door, there were these um, carved, wooden carved pieces, these door posts essentially, but they were, you know, broad, um, right next to the door. And um, when the church was demolished, those pieces were saved and I think reused, actually. Um, oh. You know, now they're in a museum. OK. But I think they were put on another church. So not only were these things on this original church, but then it was used on another church. Right. So right. it was considered so appropriate to have. I'm going to explain what was what was on them. But it was considered so appropriate to have that on the outside of a church that it actually got reused. It, it wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, this is some weird anom anomaly. You know, let's not let's not do that again. No, they're like, this um, so, is church approved. Yes. Yeah, right. It was, you know, these were Christians. Like there were no pagans really around at this time. Okay. Um, that, I'm, that I'm aware. I don't think there were in 12th, 12th 13th century. In that uh, area. Norway. Right. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, and so what was on there? So it's basically scenes from the legends of Sigurd. Right. Right. So. Sigurd, right, Sigurd is the guy who kills the dragon Fafnir. That's probably the one thing that my people people might know about him, if mm. they know anything about him. Um, his story in, in, is, you know, kind of inspires the the Ring Cycle by Wagner. And, of course, um, Inspired Tolkien, a, right? a yeah, Tolkien writes his own, yeah, exactly. Tolkien writes his own version of Sigurd and Gudrun. But then also elements of the Sigurd story make their way into other parts of Tolkien. Like, so, for instance, there's a, a whole big thing about the sword that was broken. You know, mm, that gets reformed mm. in the Sigurd story. Well, that's in the Lord of the Rings. That's Aragorn's story. That sounds story. familiar, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's other elements from Sigurd that make their way into the story of Turin Turambar, which is in the Silmarillion, and other stuff like this. So so that's Sigurd. Uh, he's he's a Norse pagan hero. Right, he, slays he this dragon, a, right, yes. Yeah, if he, did, if he did exist, he certainly never became a Christian, right? Right. And these stories, these stories are pagan stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and they involve pagan gods, right? You know, part of this whole cycle of stories includes Odin and Thor and, you know, Loki and, and all of that. Right. Um, and on the outside of this church, you would come up and see carvings of scenes from the life of Sigurd. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. When you're like <laughs> supposed to be in a holy place. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've had some, like, I, I brought this up one time with some people and they're like, oh, well, this was to sort of trap pagans. You know, what? and I was like, wait, like, so wait, what do you say? You're saying bait and switch. Pagan... Yeah, right. Exactly. Bait and switch. So you're, they're, you're they're try, trying to say that the pagans who, as far as I know, again, don't live in that area uh, in this period. Pagans are going to going to see this church building, mm -hmm. which I'm sure they know what a church looks like. They're going to walk up to the front of it. They're going to see these images from their own pagan mythology. And they're going to go, oh, Maybe they worship Thor in here, <laughs> and they're gonna go then go through the doors, and nope. they're gonna see iconography of Jesus <laughs> everywhere, and you know the Eucharist being offered to him, and people praising Christ, and talking about how he defeated the gods of the nations, and they're gonna say, "Well, since I'm already here, I might as well be a Christian." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's the story that they're telling. Right, like, and so what is the story, Father Andrew? <laughs> Right. Right. You know, I so I don't find that plausible in case I, I concur. It's yes. It's not clear. Well, um, it's, let, let's give these ancient people. Well, I wouldn't say ancient, but well, ancient ish. Like this they, is pre-modern. Yeah. Pre-modern people. They they I mean, they weren't dummies. Like, no, no, yeah. no, no. So I would say that this is an example of. This wasn't bait and switch because there was mm -hmm. no question of who was worshipped in that building, mm -hmm. you know, um, and how he was worshipped and so forth. You know, like it's not again religion in that in the you know twelfth thirteenth century Norway does not function the way it does now. Like oh I wonder what they do in here, you know. Like that's mm -hmm. not the way it goes. Um, 
rather what's happening is essentially to say that this story, which is part of the kind of the Norse consciousness of who, what it means to be a North man, right? Mm -hmm. The Norse. Um, although, I mean, they didn't actually use that word for themselves. These terms, actually, North man is an English term for these people. Oh, what um, did they call themselves? Uh, they mostly call themselves like Danes or, or this kind of thing. Uh, okay. If you look at the actual literature, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I mean, that, that's my understanding anyway. But but anyways. Um, I, I will believe you, sir. <laughs> right, right. Or, or usually by tribal tribal names, you know. Like, right. Yeah, which you see like in Beowulf. Now, Beowulf is not a Norse poem. It's actually Old English. But like, for instance, right. there's, the, there's the Shieldings and the Wilfings and these various tribal groups. OK, it sounds like the names of the hobbits. But yeah, right. Like the, the Bucklanders huh. and the. Yes, yes, exactly. The exactly. Proudfoots and whatnot. Right. Yes. So so it's essentially saying like this story that is part of the Norse story of, of who they are. This is the world into which Christianity has entered. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to pretend like it doesn't exist. Okay. Know? And then just and and then just think about exactly where it's positioned. It's in this case, it's positioned on the outside of the church, and so uh -huh. you literally have to enter through that story and to get to the the full story. You know, the okay. the, the real story, right? Okay. Which is so the, the positioning matters as well. Yes, especially in, in this particular case. What's what's happening here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, one and thing they're not trying to like, whitewash the story. Like there, it's there. No. Like it's it's yeah. it. Yeah. These stories yeah. were there before. Yeah. Yep. Christianity. Yep. And you know what? One, one, one thing I've noticed, it seems and I, I have to make a, a, a greater study of this. So this is just sort of my um, preliminary, uh, you know, reflections on what I've seen in some of these objects. Christians seemed to be more ready, especially when they're depicting stuff that's going to be incorporated into explicitly Christian objects, like a church, mm -hmm. to include images from pagan stories that don't necessarily include, usually don't include the gods, but maybe mortals who are sort of involved in the stories. Okay. That seems to be more common. That That's my, like I said, that's my preliminary impression. I, I need to study this some more. Um, so that's an interesting. So when you look at those those images of Sigurd, you know, uh, uh, Reagan is there, who is the guy that he, they go to kill Fafnir together, and Fafnir is there. But like, if I recall correctly, like you don't see Odin or Thor. I, I might be wrong. Um, you know, write in, correct me, let me know. But um, so so that's one of the things that's going on there. And then, you know, like this actually directly parallels something that I saw when I went on pilgrimage to Mount Athos. So in one of the, and, and I think it's multiple monasteries there, but I'll just mention one where I remember seeing it. And where and that's is Mount the, Athos for those who... So Mount Athos, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mount Athos is a peninsula in Greece. Okay. So there's a big peninsula that kind of reaches down to the Aegean called the Chalkidiki Peninsula, and that has three sort of finger peninsulas that reach down. The easternmost one is called Athos, and it's named for the mountain that's at the very southern tip of it. Okay. Okay. So Mount Athos is basically a, a monastic, semi-autonomous republic within Greece, and um, almost everyone that lives there is a, an Orthodox monk, thousands okay. of Orthodox monks. Um, uh, and then, so so at the monastery of Vatopedi, which is one of the big monasteries of Mount Athos, um, if you go, uh, I, I don't. I don't think it was in the narthex of a church. I think it was like in a gatehouse or something like this. But so you narthex do sometimes is the entrance. The outer space, yeah, right. yeah, exactly. The sort of transitional space between the world and the church, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it was in the narthex in this case. If I recall correctly, it was like in the gatehouse or somewhere around there. But it, this this image I'm about to describe does exist in some narthexes. Okay. Uh, I know that. I've seen photos. Um, and that's images of pagan philosophers. So you get right. Plato, Aristotle, the big Socrates, ones. you know, yeah. a lot of these guys who... I mean, some of them, frankly, are demon worshiping pederasts. Like that's literally what Socrates is. Okay. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, here they are out at the entrance, either to the monastery or the entrance to a church mm -hmm. because of the true things they said. Mm -hmm. And it's regarded as being um, part of what's called in Greek, the propedia, which means the, the pre-learning towards the gospel. Mm. Right. So you can learn some virtues from pagan philosophy, even though these people are pagans. I mean, mm -hmm. they are worshiping demons, okay? Um, you know, you can receive some of that, and that 
in a way, helps you in your entrance into the church. And mm. so you think about how this would apply, like, with Sigurd on the outside of this North Church. Um, you know, it's his sort of virtue and heroism in certain ways, not every single thing that he did, actually. But Sigurd is one of the sort of better people in that in, in that mythology, frankly, mm. from a Christian mm -hmm. from a Christian. He's definitely we, not a Christian figure. They didn't have Christ as the arch archetype in these uh, right. pagan right. stories. <laughs> right. Because they're exactly. pagan. Exactly. So, so this same kind of thing is going on. Again, it's the entrance to the church, explicitly pagan images, mm -hmm. explicitly, right? Um, now, there's no altars being put, put in front of these, these pictures, these right. icons. They're frankly. not being venerated or worshipped. They're not being venerated. They're not being worshipped, mm -hmm. you know, but it's there. It's part of the story. So mm -hmm. that's what's going on there. Okay, so that is, I think, key is part of the story. We're not going to whitewash. We're not going to do what Martin Luther did and have some book burnings. <laughs> no, no, that's not what's going on here. I mean, right. it, it's interesting. You know, Christians did have book burnings uh, even prior to Martin Luther, mm. but often it was it was book burnings of heretical Christian materials. Mm, okay. Because because that was often, especially depending on the era you were in, if paganism was much more of a going concern then you get a different treatment, right? Um, the rise of heresy actually happens much more after paganism has kind of been mostly defeated. Mm. Okay, okay. You know, um, where you get these sort of deviations from Christianity that occur. Uh, and sometimes, indeed, the writings of those of those heretics were burned. And the point of it, was, it wasn't, was say, look, look, we're like Nazis, we like to do book burnings. No. The, the, the point, yeah, the point is essentially like, look, um, this stuff is harmful, it's, right, it's okay. hazardous waste and it needs to be gotten rid of. Right. Oh, it's just such a, sorry, I'm just, I've just been reading about this and it's just so sad. Just thinking about the works of Aquinas being burned by Luther. Anyway, um, they weren't necessarily Aquinas, but if they were there, they would have been burned according to Tom Holland. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Right. So you're like, okay, that's nice, Andrea. I'm no, no, you're no, into no. this book that you're reading. <laughs> this is relevant to all of this, right? Um, right, and, right. And a lot of it has to do with the sense of how much of a threat this is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How much of a threat actually is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, heresy becomes a real live threat and it becomes a threat to the unity of the church, a threat to people's salvation. And so as a result, then that's where you get that, right? But you so, want to preserve the things that that are part of the story that will not dr draw people astray, but will lead them on the path towards like, oh, like in Dante, who was it that was it? So Virgil, wasn't that who took him through? Yeah, yeah. And then Virgil. who took him through? Um, so he through through Haiti or through hell, and then through um, purgatory, purgatory or the purgatory one. Who who was which one was that? That was also a philosopher. I'm blanking now, and I feel. Really oh impressed. darn it! Where's Richard Rowland? When you yeah, exactly. But I remember that Beatrice, you know, is his sort of patron saint in Paris. I know that. Yes, yes. Yeah, the gal he met right. three times. Yeah, no. Yeah, so I got two out of three. Okay, so come on. Yeah, no, I'm no, but yeah. So it was guy. Virgil for sure, and I, I think, think it was right. like Cicero or. Yeah, right. So I mean, that's that's kind of the point that Dante is making. He's essentially saying the same kind of thing. Like this can guide you on the way. It doesn't take you into paradise. Oh, okay, but, that's why they're there. Maybe, that's why they can take you through. Yeah, can can if understood correctly, can get you to the doors, right? Right. Um, and and you know this is interesting. So like, there's there's this awesome um, get text. you to the doors. That's that's an interesting. Yeah, yeah. Way yeah. To there's look this at it. awesome yeah. text by Saint Basil the Great, okay, which uses which is usually called something like "Address to Young Men on the Uses of Greek Literature." Great is the way long it's titled title. Or something like yeah. That. Yep. Yeah, right, right, right. I, I don't know that St. Basil actually gave it a title. Um, okay. But but the point is that, Saint, so what, what's doing, what St. Basil is doing in this is he's essentially saying, um, now when he's talking about Greek literature, that means Homer and, and, and this kind Odyssey of stuff, right, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. He's talking about pagan mythology, mm -hmm. okay? Um, he doesn't say, you know, you throw that away, you burn it, you get rid of that, you know, we don't, we're not pagans. That's not what he says. He actually says, um, when you read this, because he says you should read it, mm -hmm. when you read this, you imitate the virtues that you see there, mm -hmm. but the evil that you see there, you leave that aside. Okay. Right. And then, and then he uses this image of the honeybee, right? And he says, the bee goes from one flower to the next and collects what it needs and leaves the rest. And that's the mm. way a Christian should be. 
when dealing with pagan literature. And then he says something that would be crazy to most modern Christians, and it's something that I don't actually tell people that they should do this. Okay. Um, well, you're going to hear it here, folks. St. Basil is willing to tell people that they need to master this literature First? before they read the Bible. Before Ooh. they read the Bible. Oh, okay. Huh. Now, again, I do not preach that. Right? Okay. And, 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 but he does. You know, and he's he a did. church father. He did. Now, now, Basil is, is, he's talking, he's speaking, writing at a time where paganism is definitely on the way out. You know, okay. it still does exist in, in some areas there in his area, but, but it's mostly on the way out. It's basically been defeated. Okay. Um, but he actually, so, so I mean, he, he would have no reason to actually say this. Like, he's not, offering something up so that the pagans don't get him. He's not afraid of pagans. It's like there's mm -hmm. there's no danger from pagans in his time of place. Right, he's not being like you know? coerced to say this. Yeah, right. yeah, it's not a problem. He doesn't need to sort of offer this up as a sop, you know. Um, and in any event, if you're trying to suck up to pagans, you would just simply praise their gods and their stories. You wouldn't be saying, yeah. now this is how we as Christians need to be careful about reading them, you yeah. know. Um, so, but he, so he says that again, I, I'm not saying I disagree with him, but I'm also saying I, I would not suggest that to people of my time and place. I don't, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea, but the mm -hmm. point that he's making is the formation you receive from what's in these stories, uh, actually helps you to understand what's in the scriptures mm -hmm. and part of what's going on there. It's not just like there's some virtue there that can be taught, although that's part of it. But also it's that the scriptures, so much of it really is a response to what's happening in paganism. And, and mm -hmm. I would say actually does not make much sense if you don't understand ancient paganism, at least on some level. Okay. You know, that, that God's response to this rebellion and – uh, of the fallen angels against him and the worship of them by the nations. God's response to that doesn't make any sense if you don't know that that happened and what was going on there and what that looked like, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, then that sets up the question of like, which things should you be eating <laughs> and that, that sort of thing, right? That's, that's what sets that up, right? So, so that was, I mean, that's St. Basil. I mean, he's, he's not some obscure, weird, esoteric church father. He is one right. of the big names in Orthodox Christian theology. And even, mm -hmm. you know, Almost any Christian who reads the Church Fathers is going to read Saint Basil and you know and see his 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 stature, right? So, so, so he's one of the key people for this. And again, this this text is on the internet; it's in translation. You can read it. Everybody's everybody's got access to it. Mm -hmm. So, I, I wanted to mention a couple of other objects. Um, okay. I especially love those 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 doorposts, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to mention a couple of other objects. Um, another one is one from 10th century Denmark. So again, this is. Um, this is actually on the cusp of Christianization. So this is when Christianization happens in Denmark, after, right after it's occurred. Mm -hmm. um, so these are what are called the the yelling stones. And by yelling, I'm not I don't mean like yelling like shouting. Yeah. Uh, it's yelling with a J. So it looks like yelling stones. Oh, okay, okay. But, but J is generally pronounced ya yeah, in yeah. Um, in Scandinavian languages. So the yelling stones they they were made in 10th century Denmark. And they are they are rune stones. Oh, okay. So so what's a rune stone? I mean, rune stones were a pagan object with like mm -hmm. images of their gods, sometimes you know spells. Uh, okay. Uh, you know these are cultic things uh, within mm -hmm. the, the the pagan world, and so the Christian ruler of Denmark, Harold, mm -hmm. he decides to make his own rune stones. He orders his own rune stones to be made. Okay. And uh, on the rune stones, there's basically two big images. One is Christ crucified, mm -hmm. and it's in a very Scandinavian style of of art. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also uh, another image on these stones is a serpent wrapped around a lion, mm. right? Um, and they're called rune stones because they have runes on them. So what are runes? Uh, you know, a lot of people like they think think of runes as like magical letters or whatever. And certainly they were understood in this way um, in a lot of you know, a, a lot of periods, but they're also just letters that spell out right. things. It, it's right. an alphabet, you know, like a writing. So, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So this these engraved runes on these rune stones say uh, basically, Harold or I Harold ordered the making of these things. I who who am the one who turned the Danes to Christ. That's essentially mm -hmm. what it said. 
So it's, okay. it's talking about how he made the Danes Christian. Right. And so right. they mimic that the, the, the things that were there before that were pagan. Right. But he's like using, again, that sort of that the other response that you said, rather than just destroying yeah. the old rune stones, which I don't know if he did or not. Did he say I Harold destroyed the old rune stones? I, I don't. I don't. I'm not aware <laughs> okay. of that. Um, maybe. So, maybe so not, who knows? Are they there, or, or you don't? We don't know. The, where the yelling is. stones are certainly there. I'm not sure about the oh, bigger ones. Oh, okay. I mean, so, we're we're certainly aware. Yeah, the yelling stones. You can go see them. Um, yeah, but they're done uh, in the fashion of of the old ones, it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so the point is, is these are Christians making new objects. Mm-hmm. In both of these cases, the, the the church door, the doorposts, and these these rune stones are Christians making new objects and deliberately including pagan stuff. So in mm-hmm. this case, it's not just images; it's the whole form. Like he created mm-hmm. rune stones. Like wait a minute, right. rune stones are pagan magic, right? But this right. is this is Christian now. He's not a syncretist. He does not worship Thor. The whole point of what he's saying, or Odin, mm-hmm. the whole point of what he's saying is, I turned the Danes to Christ, mm-hmm. right? And so the what's interesting is the the image of Christ crucified looks a whole lot like Odin when Odin is hanging on his tree for however many days it was. Was it three days, you know, for for wisdom so that he can learn the magic right. of the runes for the sake of wisdom. It looks a whole lot. Well, I mean, it sounds a whole lot, lot like. Look, look this up. Look this up. You, you can see pictures of this on Wikipedia. The Yelling Stones again is spelled with a J. J E L L I N G stones. Look it up on Wikipedia. You can see pictures of this. It looks almost just like Odin, uh-huh. when in the images that exist of Odin hanging on, you know, Yggdrasil, the world tree. Okay. So wait. So is he just appropriating their old symbols towards Christ then? Yeah. 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 So and that's this is exactly okay. Like some, yeah. Totally. So this is exactly like we see in the Old Testament. Like this image of the God hanging on the tree. The world. That's tree. actually Christ. Sorry, That's you guys actually got Christ. it wrong. Yeah, it's actually like you're on. You're on to you. You. you you've been brought up to the, like, to the threshold. Yeah. With that, could yeah. you say in a way, in, in yeah. like I guess to to quote like so Pajot, like the pattern is right. there, but then to be brought the whole way through, it's yeah. this is the way. Yeah, I swear now the word pattern you can't say it without like invoking Pajot now. I know. Like it's I like know. he owns that word. Come on. Well, okay, so here's the deal. So there's a guy who makes memes in the Peugeot community. And there's, he did this one that was an old, uh, see, I, I don't remember it. But, but people who were in internet culture when memes were new, it was like, like, so he changed it. I don't remember the original words, but it's like pattern, 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 pattern. And it's like this guy, and then snake, there's a snake. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if you know what this thing is. You can, Does yeah, anyone whatever. know who this memester is? I know, I know. And I, I don't know. So, so anyways, I, so I actually brought up this with my interview with Peugeot a few times back. Like they, they made a meme from that, like into this old, they mapped that onto this old meme. I'm like, pattern, Peugeot. Thank you. So I just in my head forever. It just I'll I'll link it. Anyone who's interested. It's an old <laughs> meme, sir, but it checks out. Yeah, so yeah. That, well, you know, star, it, it's Star-Wars integrated into our head. Is his? It's his legacy as the pattern guy. But yes. anyway. Yeah. No. No. I mean, it's it's great. I'm I'm happy for him to own the word. <laughs> right. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So so you know again this is the same kind of thing you know that that you know it's not odin hanging on the world tree yggdrasil in order to gain wisdom it's mm. the one who is the wisdom of god hanging on the tree that becomes the salvation of the world mm. and that's christ mm-hmm. right the one who actually defeats the very power of death so right. much greater than odin mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's what's it, going on here you know um so so again it's not syncretism at all it's not right. saying jesus not saying Jesus is like Odin, you know. The point is, it's actually kind of a correction. Like you know, Odin, like that story. Yeah, like is, you're getting is, something is, right here, but let me right, show you what. But let's really finish happened. the whole story. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. exactly, exactly. So yeah, and 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 you, you know, we should remember, right? Everything we know actually about Norse uh, mythology, oh, thanks, especially Snorri. text, thanks. is all either preserved <laughs> is actually written by Christians. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. 
So, you know, someone sometimes people like they're, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll want to sort of reconstruct or try to, you know, like, oh, well, you know, this is what Norse religion really looked like. Like the only thing, the only reason we know anything about Norse religion is through the eyes of Christians. So like. Right. I, and that's, I've that's heard some people that, unsure, like, oh, how much can we trust that the Christians got it correct? Right. But. And that we're at the mercy of them. Right, that's that all we know. That is literally all we've got. Right. All we've got, you know, uh, arguments from silence are. I mean, they they could be fun speculation. We don't know, right? We, we, don't, don't, we know. don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, and and generally speaking, was, like what yeah. archaeological things we might find, like stuff that was shoved down in the bogs when Thor was being worshipped or whoever, right? Um, generally, is consistent with what we see in Christian texts. Okay. About these things, it's generally consistent. I'm not a specialist in this stuff, but that's what I right. sort of observed in my own reading. Okay. Right, so yeah. Well, yeah. I I have a question then. Um, about the, for our own, like within Christendom, they had multiple opportunities to rename days of the week or months of the year in English in any way. <laughs> and they were not taken. And, and you can see variations in other languages, right. in the Latin languages that are really similar to ours, you know. And, and so yeah. Yeah. that's another pagan thing. God Oh, totally. Means. Totally. I mean, Why? it's not universal. It's not universal. Right. Like in Greek, for instance, the names of the days of the week are totally Christianized. Okay. Right? Okay. So th that uh, went. Well, why not? Except with for us? where they're. Except, yeah. Except for where they're literally just numbers. So, oh. so okay. like, like Sunday is Kyriaki. Okay, the Lord's Day. Yeah. Right. Uh, Russian actually is Voskresenie, which means the Resurrection Day. Oh, um, nice. Friday is well Paraskevi. Easter, like pagan god, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Friday is Paraskevi, which means the day of preparation. And then Saturday okay. is Savato, and it means Sabbath. But then all the yeah. other names of the days of the week are literally just numbers. You know, oh. Veftara is Monday. That means second, like the second day. Like, and it just goes two, three, four, you know, you know, Let's right. just two, not three. get in the weeds. Let's just have the number. Okay, well, it's yes, simple there. Numbers. But, but for us, yeah. th those of us who do, so why, why did they just leave that and not, I mean, in the context of what we're talking about, like what... It's because it's number one. It's totally non-threatening to Christianity. Okay. It's totally non-threatening that these names should be retained, right? And but um, why were they retained in the why why were they changed in Greek, but then say not in these Latin? I, I guess I'd, I'd say I, in I, the Latin I, I, languages. I, I don't know, uh, but I can say that I'm pretty sure that it's not like the people who just who who just never made a decision about changing the names of the days of the week in English. Um, although English's days of the week are actually from multiple different traditions and mythologies and languages. I know, that's why I'm like, like Germanic, got, Latin. Yeah, right, we've like, got Norse, yeah. Germanic, we've got Latin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Saturn's day, Sun's day, but then suddenly, yeah. and then Moon's day, and then suddenly you've got Trues and Thor and Woden and, you know, like and Freya it's- and, and Freya, and yeah, Thor, exactly. Yeah. There's a, yeah. sort of this weird mix. Um, because just that's the, you know the way that language works is is kind of a weirdly mysterious thing. It's not like there was a committee that sat down and said, "Okay, we're going to fix all this." Right. Uh, interestingly, but when the you calendar, generally, the the Gregorian calendar, like that was. Yeah, I mean, generally, when you get big reforms of like names of days of the week, it's because some totalitarian government has come in and decided we're going to change the the very way that time itself works. Right. Okay. Uh, so we we just it's just this accumulation. It's just, just simply left, we left it and we weren't utterly not threatening. About it. And, and right. now it's so denatured and so declawed that no one, when they say, I'm going to go to work on Monday, thinks that they're worshiping a moon god by doing that. Right. Uh, no, yes, no, I, one, I will no one agree with that. I, I mean, maybe there is some some moon worshiper out there who's like totally <laughs> into the fact that Monday is moon day. Yeah. But or yeah. that month is moon, you know, like, you know, or that the, the names of the. The months, for instance, a number of them have pagan deities in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and even a deified Roman emperor, you've got Julius Caesar is July, right. you know. And then Augustus, um, not August. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just so so non-threatening for Christianity. It's like, that. again, the right. same world that we inhabit has, has simply been Christianized, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's utterly defanged, declawed, denatured, you know. right. That's that's part of what's going on there too. It's like, in almost some ways, it's like not even worth it to bother with some of this stuff, and so it sort of gets kept by default. Right. Okay. So that's part the, of what's going. 
So what I'm getting, the thing that I, I wrote, there's a quote. I, I sorry, there are some things that I wrote down and then I, there are some things I wrote on my phone. So there, so I think that I quoted you here from other things where you have mentioned this. Um, so the process of trying to integrate the past into the story. And that's what you brought up about the, you go through, like, so the gatehouse into the, you know, the threshold of the, you know, you, it's, it's the story that brings you yeah. up that we've come through. And then the ultimate story is in the nave. Is yes. Right? right. Well, okay. and the, the nave and the and the 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 holy place, the sanctuary, then, which is where the right. altar is, right? Yeah. So you um, get yeah, brought up that's to the, the these, full these version things. of the story, right? Yeah, right. It, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Almost always, when you see any kind of pagan imagery within the church building proper, like inside that area, it's mm -hmm. almost always this kind of oppositional imagery. Uh, when when you see something that's clearly a pagan god or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. but then also you get this appropriate, you know, this. Um, this appropriation approach, you know, mm. but but if you don't know how to read it, if you don't know that Christ on clouds is dissing Baal, mm -hmm. then you're not going to even it's not it, it's so integrated it. now that you won't even know. Yeah. Right. Right. It's right. so complete. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. So there was one more object I wanted to talk about. OK. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Please. Yeah, no, it's yes. all good. I'm going to so try to find these pictures and, and yeah, yeah, show yeah. them as you're talking yeah. about them. Yeah. And, and you know, the, all these objects actually have um, Wikipedia articles, so you can mm -hmm. pull up pictures from there and stuff. Um, uh, and I think that this last one in some ways kind of pulls all, some, all this stuff together. And it's called the Franks Casket. F-R-A-N-K-S. Okay. And it's not a reference to the Franks, um, you know, the tribe of the Franks, the Germanic tribe. It's actually just a reference to the last guy who owned it before it got into the British Museum. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So this guy's casket, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, he, 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 he wasn't in it, I mean. Right, um, he owned it. Uh -huh. Yeah, he yeah. owned it. And, and, you know, they say casket, okay, and that's because it is shaped like a casket tomb, okay, but it's like this big. Oh. You know, it's not like okay. actually something a whole human body could have been laid out in. Okay. Okay. So it might be um, a reliquary. It okay. might be just a box that looks like a reliquary. Mm -hmm. um, often reliquaries looked like above ground tombs. Okay. Um, because frankly, that's what a lot of them initially were. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know. We, it's a box. Um, mm -hmm. It's a box that's, that looks and is shaped like, you know, um, a casket. But and it's called a casket, but it's it's not big, you know. Okay. Um, and um, if you look at again, if you look at the Wikipedia article, you can actually see the measurements of it. It's eighth century Northumbrian. Mm -hmm. So Northumbria is this northern kingdom in England, just south of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And by the eighth century, pretty much everyone there is Christian, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, this object is so Christian that we're pretty sure based on various ways that they test these things, that it was actually made by monks. Okay. Okay. So, so, you know, even if you could say, okay, uh, you know, King Harold and up in Denmark, you know, he's got some leftover paganism. And so, you know, he's making these rune stones. What are you doing, Harold? Yeah. Um, these are people who spend their entire lives worshiping and praying to the Holy Trinity and okay. monks, you know, yeah. You, you 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 just don't get more Christian in your culture than being a monk, right. where yep. you're literally going to church multiple times a day, yep. worshiping the true God. You know, like this is monastic. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Exactly. So on this casket, the whole thing is just utterly covered in in carvings. Okay. Right. Every surface, pretty much, and um, there's only one image of all these carvings that that is really that we know for sure is a specifically Christian um, scene. Okay. And that's the, the adoration of the Magi. So you see the Magi worshiping Christ as a, as a child, uh -huh. right? So it's pretty clear that you've got those, you know, that's what's going on there, right? Mm -hmm. um, on that same panel, just the other side of that same panel, right? And essentially the same rectangle um, is an image of, a figure called Waylon Smith. Sounds like a country uh, singer, but yeah, right. Doesn't he? Yeah. Like Waylon Jennings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure enough. Waylon Jennings is named after a Germanic God. Oh, well then or, or I guess Germanic. That's where the country. Semi-divine hero. 
Okay. Yeah, so so Waylon is this um, Smith deity, Smith hero from Germanic legend um, that seems to possibly have been worshipped in various parts of England uh, and, and also over in, in uh, the northern Germanic area on the continent. And he's this Smith figure, right? Mm -hmm. And there's actually a couple of different places in England where there's these standing stones that are referred to as Wayland Smithy. That are these, okay. you know, it's it's almost like a mini Stonehenge in, in some yeah. ways. Yeah. Um. So, it, it's a clear scene from a pagan, a pagan story. Um. There's other stuff on this same. Again, this is made by monks. Mm -hmm. Possibly some kind of reliquary. Yeah, I cannot stress that more. We don't know monks. what was put into it. I mean, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. As far as far as I know, um. But so there's other images on here. You've got uh an image of Romulus and Remus. Okay. Two brothers yeah. who found Rome, right? The founders yeah. of Rome. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, there's text next to it that explicitly identifies them as Rom Romulus and Remus. In case anyone was confused. Oh, right, right. It's, there's yeah. no question about that. These twins, um, they yeah, be yeah. these guys. Right, right. There's another scene on there that's from the Roman taking of Jerusalem in the year 70. So this mm -hmm. is when the temple gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it's a reconquest of Jerusalem, right? Because there's this um, revolt, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are various other images on there that there's a lot of debate about what they are. Okay. So here's some of the here's some of the the the, the, the prime guesses. Um, one might be your friend Sigurd that we oh, saw yay. at that Norwegian church. Yeah. Happy to see him again. Yeah. Another is Balder. So there's mm -hmm. you go. There's some more Germanic. Oh, there's so, you, the, the pattern of the the death and. Right, right. Eventual uh, yeah. Hengist and Horsa, who are also Germanic figures, you know. Um, there might be one that is the madness of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's a potentially Christian okay. thing. Okay, okay. Which is an interesting an interesting image to have on a, an object like this. Again, made by monks. Yeah. Um, and then another one might be Satan hovering over the nativity of Christ. Okay, that's super creepy. But yeah, right. Okay, but like exactly. Christian enough? So So wait, okay. So why and I should I feel like I should know after by the end it's like did you not learn anything Andrea but <laughs> so why do they have these things on this reliquary or this yeah, uh, little cabinet? a box anyway yeah we, we, we can't say it was a reliquary but it, right. it looks so like why, a lot of reliquaries. well why why we so, think that would be in the church in it wouldn't or sorry in their monastery it wouldn't be I mean it's it was definitely made on holy ground by yes people so why would they include those. Right. So so I, I think that what's going on here is kind of all of these things at once, mm -hmm. um, except syncretism. There's not there's not any indication from the the images or the texts there that there's any kind of encourage encouragement towards worshiping other gods. Right. No monk would ever make such a thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, so the contrast is super strong there. And yet you have all you have these these scenes from pagan mythology, mm -hmm. and and a lot of these are uh, uh, notice that they are sort of uh, national myths, mm -hmm. right? So Sigurd mm -hmm. is part of the national myth of the sort of Germanic mythology. These uh, people's Ra stories, Romulus and Remus, the, the, the national the myth of the story, founding yeah. of Rome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Hengist is is this figure that's associated with the founding of England. Okay. Um, you know, so so these things are kind of there together. So if you're trying to come up with some kind of theme, then maybe that sort of works. Um, you know, the adoration of the Magi, in some sense, is a sort of national myth of Christianity, right? Because you're looking mm -hmm. at the, you know, that that moment, and of course, it's the knee, the, the the Magi coming to worship Christ represent. They're from the East. Uh -huh. This is what I'm going to suggest: is that that image is the one that interprets the rest. Okay. Okay. Now, this is my reading of it. I'm not saying yeah. this is an official scholarly reading or whatever. And so what is that image? That's an image of the nations coming to worship Christ. Okay. You know, they are from these far away places where they worship the stars. Mm. And they come to worship Christ. And mm. then all of these things are now being put in service to Christ. Okay. Right. And uh, it's, you know, I, I, I recommend people uh, to look this thing up and just look at the pictures of it. Um, and maybe mm -hmm. you'll be able to add this here in the in editing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's absolutely it's astonishingly beautiful for one thing um and it's just crazy all of these different images that are on it you know and we have we have sort of two options for reading this like we can look at this and say how stupid were pre-modern christians for crying out loud that they would put all these pagan things on their objects right um or we can say wait a minute there's something deeper going on here that actually right. is about the triumph of christ and all the nations coming frankly to worship him um, mm -hmm. and I, and I think that the thing that we see in common with all of these things is that it's all about directing people to Christ. It's mm -hmm. always about directing, whether it's about saying, turn away from demons mm -hmm. or it's about saying, no, no demon, that, that image doesn't belong to you. Yeah. Or, or it's about saying, you know, um, uh, uh, this, this, this story that's been associated with demons now is being turned to be, to feed into the gospel itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's a lot of what's going on there. So so the, the key takeaways, you know, is are what's the difference between this practice? And I don't know that there's a name for it of sort of incorporation of pagan images and narrative into Christian images and narrative, mm -hmm. um, including in the Bible itself. I don't know that there's a name for that. We should come up with something. What's the difference between that and syncretism? Right. So so from the point of view of Scripture, I mean, it doesn't use the word syncretism, but the thing it's constantly warning against is do not worship other gods. Mm -hmm. And writing stories about them, putting pictures of them, or even their, the mortals that they dealt with, which seems to be the more frequent thing, mm -hmm. is not the same as worshiping them. Right. Worshiping them is about putting food in front of an image of them, offering it to them, maybe burning mm -hmm. some part of it and eating it yourself. That's what worship really is. And and we also don't venerate them even. So we're not even So can we go into what veneration debate. is next to worship? Like what Yeah, so is? so veneration veneration simply is to offer honor, you know, okay. to something or someone or whatever. Right? Okay. Uh, you know, we, we as, as Christians we don't venerate pagan deities. We we make fun of them. Right. <laughs> that's the, that's right. the that we, we we smash them. You know, that's the, the the pattern that we see in scripture and in subsequent Christian tradition. Okay. Right. Right. Um, so that's the difference. There's a difference between saying, look, this all feeds into the story of Christ and saying, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and worship these other beings. Like, don't do that. You mm -hmm. know, come back to Christ. That's that's what's going on with all of it. That's that's the, the thread that runs through all of these things, you know. We, we mentioned like why this is sort of a problem for the modern materialistic point of view, because number one, materialism sort of doesn't even recognize the existence of the spiritual world. And so right. if you've got this, is, this whole thing has been what yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> for those of you who are not in a, in a <laughs> belief of any sort of spiritual anything, right, right. this even, will sound like we're a couple of quacks. Yeah. 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 But even <laughs> Christians tend to function as materialists. Like all that other stuff mm. is just stories. And, of but, course, but, yes. but my God is the real, the real God. Right. Or, yeah, no, you know, all the rest is just nothing. It just it's just nonsense. False, yeah. false, false but, according but, to what we think it is now. Yeah, But the scripture real. doesn't treat it that way. Right. So if I'm a Christian, I believe in the scripture, I believe what it says, then that means I need to take seriously what it takes seriously. Right. And don't think mm -hmm. that I know better, because I super don't. Right. I super don't. Super duper don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so that that's how this is this, this is a kind of a problem. Um, someone might say, okay, I, I, I agree with all of that. That makes all, all makes total sense. But what the heck does that have to do with me living here in 2021? Right. Like, you know, like that is no, a good there's question. There's no Zeus worshipers out there outside my window, you know? Right. Um, number one, there actually might be like, like now there is a temple of Odin. I know in, um, in Iceland, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Sacrifices Just to pagan gods are now a thing again. So, mm. so don't fool yourself. Um, but but even if you set that aside, right, the reality is that the demonic has not left the world. Mm -hmm. So even though we might be not doing this kind of explicit, uh, you know, face-to-face uh, -face confrontation with the worship of pagan gods as a kind of religious practice, mm -hmm. nonetheless, all the things that the pagan gods were offering to people, strength, beauty, attractiveness, success, wealth, all of, you know, fame, prestige, power, all of this stuff is still on offer and people are still making sacrifices to attain all those things. In very, very different ways, but it's we still just screw tape letters, people. 
Yeah, it's still absolutely happening. Mm -hmm. And so then that means that Christians can therefore behave in the same ways that our forebears in the faith did when confronting traditional paganism, but we can simply do it in ways that are creative for our time, just as they were creative for their time. You know, when Harold set up those rune stones in Denmark in the 10th century, that was probably a new thing, as far as I know. Like, mm -hmm. no one else was mm -hmm. doing that. But he's like, you know what? I have an idea. And it made right. total sense. Mm -hmm. And it made total sense. And so we can use the 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 media and the the tropes and the stories and whatever else of our day and repurpose them, subvert them, all in the service of the gospel of Christ and show how mm. once again, he has conquered the demons of all that have been stirring up our passions and offering uh, true love and beauty and power and glory and, you know, all of that mm -hmm. belonging, all of these things that people, you know, become addicted to attain, but get from somewhere other than Christ. So mm -hmm. all of this is very, very relevant for our time. And I think the fact that we can see it through this confrontation, this direct confrontation with paganism, really throws in a very sharp relief for us so we can see it very, very clearly and know what it is we have to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it, I think that there's a lot of arrogance. It's like, oh, those, like in whichever version of whether you agree or not with anything supernatural or you're like, no, nah, okay, there's some supernatural, sure, but... But we're we're not like them, you know. Like like, there's that eyebrow. I saw the eyebrow raise. Nope, <laughs> nope, sir. We are very much the same, and and can be brought down very easily. And 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 so looking at the way that ancient Christians and medieval Christians used the, and in some cases older pagan world to, as like a signpost. Yeah. towards uh, the ultimate story. Yep. Um, like these are stories pointing towards the ultimate story. That's, if I'm reading you correctly, what we can do now. Absolutely. Pointing it toward, pointing Absolutely. us towards. Absolutely. And, and you know, a great example, I mean, I, you know, I can't escape talking about him, but a great example of someone doing that is J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, he, is, he is doing that, right? Right. And um, in a really astonishingly effective way. Mm -hmm. um, such that I've known multiple people, including myself, who would say, because of Tolkien, in a lot of ways, I'm a Christian. Mm. Um, that maybe not Tolkien is the reason I'm a Christian, but but at least he's one of the ways that I got here. You know? Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. what a great place to end on, because Tolkien. I'm actually reading, I read The Hobbit to my kids, and now we're on to The Fellowship. Awesome. Have not yet left the Shire, but we're working on it. Anyways, thank you so much for being on my uh, my YouTube channel slash podcast, Father Andrew. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Andrew with the bangs. It's been a lot of fun. If you would subscribe, that would be the bee's knees.